The Philadelphia Church of God presents The Trumpet Daily. Hello everyone and welcome back to the Trumpet Daily. Imagine for a moment that you're near the end of your days and a short biography has been prepared in honor of your life and it says something like this, Ivy League educated, graduated at the top of his class, wildly successful in business, ranching, engineering and building, husband of one, father of many, strict and devout in his religion, morally upright and pure, fabulously wealthy, yet gracious and benevolent, famous for his philanthropy and service, an advocate for the poor and disadvantaged, wise and judicious, authoritative and eloquent, a lover of goodness and equity, a people person, the greatest man of his day. Not many people would be disappointed with a resume like that, and yet even before his deep repentance before God, Job could have easily been the person spoken of in that short biography. Job was the most righteous man of his day, perfect and upright, the Bible says, famous and well-liked for his many good deeds. He was a man who used his great power and wealth to help the disadvantaged, the poor, the fatherless, and the widows. He even used his tremendous power and influence to destroy pagan forms of worship. This was a righteous, and upright man. But the problem with Job was that he knew it. He knew that he was righteous. And because of that, God says that the problem with him was his self-righteousness. He was actually a horribly self-righteous individual. His sin was and is to this day the most difficult sin there is to see. Though he was perfect and upright, as it says in Job chapter 1, uh, in the way that he observed the strict letter of God's law, he was full of vanity and pride, as you'll see by the time we get to the end of today's story. Let's begin today in the book of Job, chapter 1. And we'll start in verse 4. And his sons went and feasted in their houses, every one in his day, and sent and called for their three sisters to eat and to drink with them. So here Job's children were evidently enjoying the high life, that their father's wealth had made possible uh, for them. And in this particular episode, they were partying so much so, and off into certain sins, I suppose, that Job actually felt it necessary to offer up burnt offerings for them on behalf of them because of their sins and faults. In verses 6 through 8, you can see as the story progresses that Satan and his demons uh, walk to and fro across the earth looking for those that they can deceive, looking for those that they can attack. And just as an aside here, we see how that in this exchange that Satan and his demons have with God, there are limitations on Satan's power. There are limitations on what Satan is able to do. Uh, he certainly is more powerful and more cunning and wicked and, and able to deceive humanity by the millions upon millions. But thank God that God is more powerful. And if we turn to God and look to God and His strength, we can have that as our sure defense. But here is a story, a biography about this man, Job, with this problem of self-righteousness, wherein God uses Satan in this sense to go after Job, to teach a lesson to Job, to help him see himself in proper relation to God. But as is also brought out, Satan is only allowed to go as far as God allows. In chapter 2, Satan is allowed to actually go after Job personally. In the first uh, exchange with God, God says, all right, you can go after the wealth, uh, you can e e even go after the children. Uh, but in chapter 2, he says, now, you can go after Job himself. Verse 3 in chapter 2 says, And the Lord said unto Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that fears God and eschews evil, and still he holds fast his integrity? That may be an indication there or a hint that God's giving to Satan of what the real problem was here with Job. 
in that you look at him on the surface and he was upright. He was a man of integrity, but the problem was, or part of it, was that he was holding fast to his own integrity. It says, although you moved me against him to destroy him without cause. I mean, God was giving Satan a hint, but if you think of it, Satan himself is the most self-righteous being there is in the universe. Satan thinks he's right. He thinks he knows more than God. He still does, even after all of the destruction that he's brought into the universe. And on to this earth. Verse 9, a little further down, it says, Then said his wife unto him, Do you still retain your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said unto her, You speak as one of the foolish women speak. What, shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? In all this did not Job sin with his lips. I mean, his wife was a, a pretty wicked woman, a difficult woman to live with, and it would be easy in this passage to pick on her, but think about what it might have been like for her living with this man who was obsessed, really. He was obsessed with himself. He was obsessed with all of his accomplishments. He talked endlessly about himself. There were probably moments when Job could not stop talking about all that he had done. And if you go to the end of chapter 2, where it says Job didn't sin outwardly, but on the inside he was beginning to have some trouble. Well, as you progress through the story, the biography covered in this lengthy book during the trial that Job had, three of his friends named Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, they came to console him there at the end of chapter 2. And for seven days, Job sat in silence, in dust and ashes, in this mournful state of self-pity. And then at the end of these seven days, finally, Finally, at the beginning of chapter 3, Job 3, Job opens his mouth and curses the day of his birth. He actually curses the day that he was born. I mean, at the beginning of this story, he had this appearance, this tough facade of maintaining his righteousness. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away, he said philosophically. That was in uh, chapter 2, I believe. And then by chapter 3, we find him so depressed. We find him going through so much suffering that he actually curses the day of his birth. Then for the next 30 chapters or so, these three friends enter into this dialogue back and forth with Job as they try to help him see the error of his ways, but they couldn't help him because they couldn't get at the cause of what brought all of this suffering upon Job. All that they could do was accuse him that, well, you're guilty. There must be some obvious, visible sin for all of these bad things to, to have happened. In their minds, I mean, they just pointed to these curses as proof that Job had sinned. But they couldn't identify the cause. They couldn't really point out the sin and what it was specifically. Verse 7 of chapter 10, it says, You know that I am not wicked. This is Job speaking. And there is none that can deliver out of your hand. I mean, you know that I am not wicked, he says to his friends. Imagine a human being saying something like that. I mean, just knowing what we know in the Bible, like in Jeremiah 17, 9 and Romans 8, 7, about what it says regarding the human heart and the wickedness that lies within the nature of man. And yet here is a man so sure of his righteousness saying to his friends, you know I'm not wicked. You know I'm a righteous man. Verse 14 says, if I sin, then you mark me and you will not acquit me from mine iniquity. If I be wicked, he says again, woe unto me. And if I be righteous, yet will I not lift up my head. I am full of confusion, it says. Therefore see you mine affliction. I mean, Job was confused because in his mind he hadn't done anything wrong. He thought he was right. He was steadfast in his uprightness. He was sure of his righteousness. And he, as many self-righteous people do today, welcomed correction if, if it could be pointed out that he needed it. Well, sure, I want correction. We all say that sort of thing. So long as I'm proven wrong, so long as you can show me where I'm wrong. But that's where it breaks down for so many people, is that we don't like to admit that we're wrong. We don't like to confess that we're wrong. That's the way it is for a self-righteous individual. 
if we get into that way of thinking, we think, well, I'm not opposed to correction, but you've got to show me where I'm wrong first. Even when suffering, Job seems so impressed with his righteousness. His friends seemed so impressed with his righteousness. <laughs> they stood in awe of what this man had accomplished, and that just fed into Job's ego as he looked at all of these people around him offering praise for his many exploits, and it just went to his head. You can see that in reading these chapters. In Job 29, for instance, it's just a short chapter of 25 verses, but in those 25 verses, Job uses the words I, me, or my 52 times. That's more than two per verse as he's talking about himself. I, me, and my. And yet consider, as I say, some of the other passages of Scripture, Isaiah 64 and verse 6, uh, for instance, where it says that our own righteousness is like filthy rags when compared to God's. I, me, and my. 52 times in one short chapter. This is what my father wrote in an article he, he uh, had on this subject many years ago. He says, we all have a certain amount of self-righteousness in us. That is just the way we are. We have to get rid of it. Humanly, it's almost impossible for us to do good deeds and not have a slight self-righteous kickback from it. See, we've all got to battle this. We've all got to go to God. James says that the Bible is like a mirror because when we peer into it, we can see all of the things that we need to remove in order to clean ourselves before God. That's why we have to study God's Word. That's why we have to pray in an attitude of humility for God to show us where it is that we're self-righteous. We need to see the self in our righteousness and get rid of it and actually go to God for His righteousness, for His character, to acquire His nature. He'll give it to us if we go through the process of repentance, baptism, faith. God will supply us with His own righteousness. That's what He's working out here below as He reproduces Himself, His character in man. He, we've had enough, haven't we, of man's righteousness? I mean, look at what it's brought us to, this self-willed approach, that man knows, that man has the answers, that just given enough time, we could solve all the problems of this world with our technology, with our advances, and so on. And yet, look at the evils multiplying all around us. Look at the dangers as they close in upon us. It gets back to this problem, doesn't it? Self-righteousness an unwillingness to confess error and mistakes and to turn to God in repentance. In Job 32 and verse 1, it says, So these three men ceased to answer Job because he was righteous in his own eyes. See, that sums up the problem that Job had. These counselors couldn't give him an adequate answer. They couldn't help him see his sin. Why? because Job was righteous in his own eyes. God tells us. I mean, there's people that are even looking into the Bible that have an awareness of what the book of Job says, who maintain that Job didn't have a righteousness or a self-righteousness problem. And if he didn't, then why did God put him through these trials and tests? And why did he have to repent at the end of the story? We'll get there in just a moment. But he had a horrible self-righteous problem, for sure. God makes that abundantly clear throughout this book. And you put it together with what He teaches elsewhere in the Scriptures. This sums up, as I said, Job's problem. None of them could offer him a solution to his problems because he was righteous, as the Bible clearly says there in Job 32.1. He was righteous in his own eyes. 